be starting with our next panel. The next panel would be uh, on payments. Uh, it will start a uh, short while in a few minute time. So just allow us a uh, few minute time and then we'll start the next panel. So in a couple of minutes, we'll be starting the next panel. We Ashish. Ashish is from Light Rock. Hi, good evening, everyone. I can see Karthik is uh, already here. We're waiting for uh, Raghu to join this uh, room. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Karthik. Karthik, we can see you well now. Awesome. Great. Uh, do we have Raghu as well? Not yet. Hi, good evening, everyone. We also have Raghu uh, over here. Uh, correct. So welcome to FinTech Summit uh, 2022 uh, presented by IIT Bombay. Uh, I'm Ashish Kar, I'm the host for this particular session, which is on digital payments in FinTech. And uh, with me, I have two very senior industry leaders uh, uh, on panel. Uh, I think we'll cover a bunch of topics in this space, uh, right? But before doing that, I'll request both Karthik and Raghu to maybe take a minute to provide a little bit more background about themselves. Uh, over to you, Karthik, first, and then maybe Raghu. Thank you, Ashish, and uh, thank you to the IIT Bombay team for inviting uh, me for this uh, FinTech Summit. My name is Karthik Ganpati, and I uh, am uh, an ITB graduate. I graduated out of ITB uh, way before a bunch of you. Uh, so that was around uh, 89 to 93. Uh, and uh, post that for about uh, a couple of years, I did my MBA from IIM Bangalore. And then uh, after that, uh, jumped into uh, a mainstream uh, financial consulting service, uh, which is Anderson for about five years. And early up in 2000, when the word uh, fintech wasn't really invented uh, is when uh, we started Build Desk. Uh, and uh, if at leisure, I can perhaps run through what were the thoughts in our mind at that point in time and how it is morphed over today. But for the past 20 years, I've been basically in the forefront of uh, the payments world, uh, you know, dealing with banks, financial institutions, merchants of different kinds, small, large, uh, innovating with uh, fintechs, partnering with uh, many of them, uh, competing in a different uh, situation. And uh, here we are, uh, you know, at the end of 20 years, we run a fairly successful uh, business. Uh, Buildesk has been uh, a pet project for many years and for a good number of years, uh, there wasn't much that we were doing, uh, but yes, in the last, eight to 10 years, there's been significant traction uh, and uh, uh, 
yeah that's how it is thank you everyone thanks so, I, think you, uh, i think we'll cover uh, some bits of your journey and we'll definitely absorb some of your wisdom which you've gained over the course of last 20 years uh, right ragu over to you yeah thanks kartik uh, yeah. inspirational uh, thanks ashish uh, uh, ragu i have a longer name than uh, kartik ragunath ganapati subramanian so <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh very uh, it's very unique combination uh, i am a second generation it uh, person my father was the first first generational one uh, i had the opportunity to learn coding when i was in my 6th or 7th standard and started my journey as a software engineer and go grew through the ranks significant portion of my career has been being a buyer and seller in the enterprise software i was uh, working with a company by name excel service as their global leader for automation and robotics exited and joined exaver as a chief technology officer uh, then joined this uh, beautiful organization by name uipath uh, the global leader in robotic process automation and artificial intelligence i joined this company when this company was uh, having around 15 people globally less than a million in valuation uh, uh, less than 500000 dollars in revenue fast forward 5 years uh, together uh, i joined them as the president and ceo for uh, india and apac was part of the global exec team and uh, worked with the team and saw through a successful listing in uh, new york stock exchange valued at 40 billion dollars so five years uh, 1 million to 40 billion seen the uh, amazing journey that every startup uh, aspires to be so uh, the theme that we keep is believe in the impossible uh, and believe in the invisible right i have been seeing almost 300 to 500 percentage year on year growth uh, operating across all the countries pretty much in the world uh so one of the theme i got from there was how to focus on wealth creation for others so that has been the passion created my family office uh, two years back which operates out of dubai and india I have around uh, the name of the family office is one dg have around 11 companies in the portfolio uh, in, if you include uipath there are around three unicorns uh, uh, then uh, sunicorns <laughs> as you call it uh, Uh, very nice investments like a company by name british world war into solid state uh, and lithium ion battery manufacturing based out of northumberland in uh, uh, uk then a uh, company by name simple energy who is setting up the largest two wheeler ev factory in the world uh, making india proud again and uh, that's how i got in touch with my current organization active.ai where i was one of the first investor and uh, i thought there is a significant amount of uh, traction and benefit this uh, this particular company has and i thought uh, that's the best way to jump in and uh, help my passion is to help entrepreneurs uh, become unicorns and unicorn means not just my wealth maximization it's about the 500 to 1000 families that these companies have and how these people can see wealth way beyond the salary income they make and how they can help in the change that india really wants so that's the that's a journey so far ashish i'll take quick opportunity to introduce ashish as well uh, so ashish is an associate director with lightrock lightrock is one of the leading fund in india which invests in multiple sector and ashish leads fintech and financial services investment on behalf of lightrock wow. prior to lightrock uh, ashish worked with uh, washington based uh, dc based fund s c uh, ashish is also fellow uh, lm from iit bombay uh, ashish uh, over to you thank you uh, devendra for a kind introduction uh, right so without wasting too much time what i will do is i have a bunch of questions basically for the panelists right and i'm actually excited myself because the last panel which i hosted for iit bombay alumni summit was on new banking right and seven seven months fast forward we ended up investing in one of the leading players in new banking space yeah, right so today's topic is also something that is very close to me it is in payment gateway space and uh though we have not made any investment over here but we believe that pay payment gateway as the name says you are practically the gatekeeper basically from where the capital is going in and coming in going out and coming in right so you have a lot of visibility with respect to how the businesses are functioning and there is a lot of things which one can do once you have access to that kind of data right so a bunch of questions basically for both you and ragu for both kartik and ragu uh, as part of this uh, conversation my first set of questions are primarily for the audience this is uh, given both of you have seen this industry over the course of last two decades how this has evolved right and more recently over the course of last 5 6 years 
especially post the uh, data becoming cheap with Reliance uh, Geo coming into the space. And then with demonetization and on top of that with uh, uh, COVID, right? Which further accelerated the use of digital payments, uh, right? So from your perspective, how have you seen this industry evolving over the course of last five, seven years? Uh, if you can spend a few minutes uh, explaining everyone about that. Any one of you can uh, take a crack first. So, uh... See, uh, we all uh, see, uh, we all we all look for the Western world to see how the entire landscape has changed, right? When I look back, uh, I was discussing uh, this specifically the uh, meeting today that we are having with my team. What came was even this very very small and minute innovation that uh, we have achieved in India as a country in last five to seven years has been truly phenomenal, right? Uh, uh, one of my team members said this and he really liked it, my co-founder and CTO. See, when you once you go to the remotest of the village, assume that person is selling a sugarcane juice, okay? You can find uh, the QR code that he keeps in that sugarcane crate uh, for payment. That's a true inspiration how India has evolved. There could not be influx of other technologies there, but there is real payment penetration technology that is happening which means every new corner of this country is going through this transformation, which is the beauty of this country. We only look at the transformation and the journey that is going on in the cities, but the true transformation is, has already started happening, right? And also the direct, direct transfer that the government initiated where every benefit the government is giving is going to the end account of the citizens of India. Uh, it's not about other, cutting off other chains or lowering of corruption. It's about bringing most people who are not in the banking sector into the banking sector so that they can get the benefit and upside of the digital world. So these two, I feel, uh, and there are many more examples, but these two, I feel, have revolutionized the way I see things as. Yeah, I Eric, think no. yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Karthik. Sorry, so... Uh, uh, Truly, uh, like Raghu said, right, uh, in 2000, when we really started off on electronic payments, the, the world was very, very different. And uh, at one level, uh, the question was, what, what is it that you could do that could actually make money? Because in those days, money was not uh, so easily available and people would not trust a bunch of people who have just exited their jobs however cushy it might be. And the whole ask was that whatever model you have, when is it that you're going to make money and how is it that you're going to make money? So I still remember those days that the conversation around discovery, analysis, getting people the right advice, all that did not uh, have any, uh, you know, bear, did not bear any uh, merit with any of the people who were talking to us. But the moment one started talking about transactions and said that here is a model where whenever a customer is making a payment, uh, a successful payment at that, there is a fee, a cut that can really happen. And that kind of a model can work. That is when the first set of people started listening to us. And from there on, uh, if you ask me how India has grown, the whole month used to pass with no payment. And then the only payments that would be there in those days would be a single one of the co-founders, uh, Reliance Energy, now Reliance Energy, but Adani Energy, but earlier BSCS payments, which was set up in a yeah. automatic payment mode. So the first six to eight years, really from a India payments perspective was all about the basic banking infrastructure getting in place. So there were, uh, internet banking was basically set up in a very, very concrete manner. And uh, IRCTC was a major catalyst. So every bank that wanted to do uh, online payments or electronic payments would first target to see how it could get onto the captive IRCTC uh, site and therefore their customers could start using the online payment services that were there. Then I think from at least India perspective, 2009 was a very, very important point because that is when the uh, RBI uh, settlement framework and intermediary definition 
they recognized merchants as a category so all these got defined and uh, very soon the reserve bank uh, brought in the uh, two factor authentication guidelines where they mandated that all online transactions should be accompanied with a two factor for security and uh, you know convenience of the card holder perspective that to our mind actually propelled a wave of uh, payment and digital adopting because the next 3 4 years the card companies really pushed hard and got a lot of the debit side of payment method into the ecosystem and uh, really by 2012 2013 you could see that india had a a bunch of payment methods you had credit card you had debit card and you had a large base of customers actually adopting so during that period 2010 to about 2015 is when really the number of payment methods and the digital adoption by customers started and then the last 5 years ashish is uh, you know is even uh, even children now talk about the last 5 years uh, and pandemic and uh, you know demonetization were two major events that happened so uh, last 5 years have been characterized by adoption by enterprises large and small medium yeah. and big and that has happened basically because of the government's push and the enabling regulation that has happened uh and of course uh, upi uh, right it's one of its kind and like ragu mentioned uh, that has allowed for use cases to be built in any manner across every nook and corner of the country you have a qr you have a payment link you have a you know so uh, these combined together have led to significant growth and of course from here it is even more likely to grow correct uh, very very fair point kartik and i distinctly remember my first experience of digital payment was on irct website uh, right and this was way back in college in 2007 it time frame <laughs> when i used uh, digital payment basically to book a ticket uh, back home and at that point in time the only place where you would you would punch your card details or your net banking was on these government websites because there you feel that this is secure and safe right, right? everywhere else uh, uh there was still this uh, missing trust uh, layer basically at that point in time we have come a long way from there to, to today uh, right but you touched upon a very important point uh, which is that there are zillions of ways by which a customer can make payment to a merchant right and there are more than 200 ways by which a customer can make payment to a merchant right and from a merchant's perspective five years back the life was very simple i know from a text perspective there were still leakages uh, there still leakages today but at that point in time he used to only collect cash hard right or the payment will hit in his bank account through an neft or rtgs right uh, so he has to reconcile only two accounts to uh, basically see how much they are earning towards the end of the day right now with advent of so many payment method and so much digital bank accounts and this is ragu to you also given that uh, your current organization is also focusing on saas products uh, right focusing on enterprise customers from a merchant or a business perspective uh, how difficult or seamless that experience has been uh, in transition transitioning from the old way of doing business to the new way of doing business right because some of the softwares which are out there they took some time to get aligned with how the market evolved uh, right if you look at how tally or uh enterprise softwares are there the way they are structured versus the way people have been collecting money or dispersing money has been very very different uh, right so how has the experience for some of these merchants be it large or smaller evolved over the period of time so uh i can take a shot at that first so ashish over the years there is not a single merchant who hasn't changed their technology platforms uh at least two to three times i'm yeah. talking about those who have not done there have been people who have done changes over five to 10 times but in the very minimum it is about three four times right and i think that is primarily because of the way 
technology itself has evolved. Technology, the support ecosystem, the partners who provide the technology to these merchants, uh, the kind of tools that are available in web 2.0 to 3.0, right? So uh, that is one. The second is that uh, in our experience, the more richer, India is the only country where you have this level of range of payment methods that is yeah. really there, right? And there's a reason for it. The, the primary reason for it is that uh, there has been no, uh, no controlled uh, or let us say uh, externally regulatory kind of controlled way in which these payment methods have evolved. Even incumbent players have always worked with the payment providers in a manner that the payment providers are able to create their own customer base, their own payment rails and their participation with customers. And they can make it more relevant and work with merchants. So merchants today have a choice of payment methods and it is just not about the 200 and therefore the complexity. It is also about the kind of uh, costs that are associated with the payment instruments, right? The merchant has a choice. For yeah. that. It is about the mode through which it can be made available. So I can do in-app payments. I can do SDK-based payments. I can do payment links, right? It's about the choice merchant has about the size of the payment. Uh, for quite a while in this country, the ability to do micro payments was very difficult. And the ability to do very large ticket payments was difficult, right? But now with more payment methods like a UPI or a RTGS or a IMPS kind of a mode, these options are now available, right? Similarly, the mode of making a payment, is it merchant initiated or is it recurring? So all in all, what has now happened is that the payment choices that a merchant can play around with is suited to the merchant's technology, the merchant's channel, the merchant's mode of collection, the ticket size, and so on. So these are extremely interesting and very rich portfolio for a merchant to play with. So it has really helped them quite a bit in the years, and they've been able to craft experiences also that work well for their customers. Got it. And at the same time, I think there are uh, specific companies also which are trying to plug that gap. Uh, right by building layers uh, basically for some of right. these enterprise customers or for merchants a bit in form of new banking embedded finance whatever we call it absolutely. so that they're able to provide a seamless uh, customer experience absolutely absolutely so uh, yeah Karthik. yeah go Raghu, please no, no, uh, uh, i uh, very 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 relevant point uh karthik what you are telling See, my point of view here is uh agree there are 200 plus players let's also understand uh, you gave in your previous example how the industry has been changing right a few data points okay in last uh, in last five years or if you see now i think we have almost uh, 2100 fintechs that has come right while you can only qualify 200 people who are focusing only on the uh, payment and payment detail solution most of the fintechs okay uh, the out of the 2100, I think uh, more than 70% came in last four to five years, correct? Most of them directly or indirectly always have a payment solution, either white label or for example, they'll use build desk. Somebody who might be putting a wrapper around build desk and might be calling it XYZ, correct? So one is from the customer perspective, two is from the merchant perspective. Customers are spoiled full of choices. Customer want to use as much as possible. There are multiple mechanisms by which the companies are owing customer, right? Some of them giving ease of uh, use. Some of them, most of them use the concept of uh, you know, uh, free stuff that they're giving or cashback that they're giving to, to the, the customers. That's a great stuff as far as completing a commerce or a transaction is concerned. Second data point, uh, is let's understand the Indian demographics, right? Okay. If you look at India as a country, uh, uh, out of our population, 65 percentage of the population is less than probably 35 years and younger. Okay. India has one of the largest amount of smartphone usage in the world. It's almost what? It's almost uh, 500, uh, 500 million. And one of 
the second largest internet usage internet uh, usage right almost 700 to 800 million internet users second largest and with the avalanche of uh, 5g it's only going to increase okay that is from the customer side so there's point of choices any fintech that is coming focuses on them they are going to do but if you look from the merchant choice uh, from the merchant's point of view it's like uh, uh, it's like a classical south indian thali right okay you put it in banana life you have 100 items that comes in the marriage so it's like uh, for them as long as the money comes to the account they don't worry they can keep changing anything and why the change is happening because we are trying to only solve a bit size problem only particular problem in the entire life cycle of a retailer or a distributor is what we are solving we are not actually going to the root and solving much more the merchants want not just one solution because all the 2100 fintechs i told about directly or indirectly uh, would be selling to these merchants some product or other so they are also spoiled for choices but they have no loyalty or stickiness to be with them so what is happening one day they are with x next day they are with z right so how can you stop this change from happening so what in our organization we are adopting is be humble listen to these people a day in the life of retailer the day in the life of distributor what is that they exactly want payment is one of the problem accepted agreed what all are the other solution that they want through which you can also combine payment as a solution that's exactly what we are trying to do otherwise it's just 200 today as the world open ups and more and more companies come to india you will find also a lot of collaboration mm -hmm. happening technology exchanges happening and more solution coming and this 200 will become 2000 correct i i don't foresee a world uh, where after uh, say 5 or 10 years we are the payment no card nothing you just go automatically things will scan you and the payment happens correct no very very fair point and i uh, we recently uh, looked at few companies basically which are trying to focus on voice or uh, uh, based payment uh, interface mechanism, right? So you're absolutely right, Raghu, with respect to how technology will evolve over the period of time. I think time is only what is going to tell us about that, uh, right? The uh, Before moving to business model, I have one more question, uh, basically, and this is uh, more Karthik for you, given that you've seen this very close corridors over the course of last two decades. And this is on how has been the uh, experience of working with banks and regulators in this space, uh, right? Especially over the course of last two decades, because Reserve Bank of India, though it is one of the most progressive uh, 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 regulator uh, amongst all the regulator in India, but at the same time, the risk associated to digital payment or digital commerce is way too high, uh, right? For anyone to phantom upon or uh, to get comfortable around, uh, right? And especially these large institutions, banks, they have a very particular way of working and the way they adopt things in a particular fashion. So how has been your experience over the course of last two decades and how has that changed, if at all, over the course of several years? All right, so I'll first cover the banks, okay? And to your last point, uh, many a time, I have uh, wondered and put myself in the shoes of the regulator and I immediately take off those shoes and said, just not possible to even fathom the things that must be going on in their mind for them to manage and sustainably evolve a large payment ecosystem like that of India. And truly hats off to them. We will talk a little bit more about that. But first, let me come to the experience with banks. Uh, the first investor in Buildest was a bank. And uh, I had read this somewhere else that, you know, uh, when fintechs come into any environment, uh, the banks are the ones that lose because the fintechs take away customers from the banks because the banks are stodgy. They can't really execute the technology that well. And the fintechs are able to present smarter, nicer interfaces and so on. So what really should happen and what should be the kind of model, right? Uh, at a high level over the years, and I think as is evident in many other markets, these entities have to actually coexist. The banks have large customer bases. They have uh, tremendous advantages in terms of existing traffic and journeys and use cases that need right solution. 
on the other hand the fintechs are new untested they just have a lot of exuberance and energy and obviously good tech and all the nice things that go with it and therefore that's the right partnership and our experience with banks has been absolutely phenomenal uh, right from day one as i said the the origin of buildesk itself started with partnering with a bank and seeing how we could provide our services to the bank's customers and therefore uh, that was the model that we as a fintech took in those days and continue to do where we basically say that the bank becomes our customer and we service the bank's customers uh we don't do a distribution kind of a model now there are fintechs that have primarily taken that as a space but banks have each bank has its own persona and it's very interesting to see that each one of them has a very unique set of capabilities there are banks who are regionally extremely powerful and the kind of sway they have with their customers is so amazing that it just requires one word from the the uh the operational person there to the head of the other side organization to say that here is a fintech uh you know please encourage them and do something with them and that is how these journeys start so building that trust and uh serviceability for the banks understanding them very well is i think a very uh, very positive journey that has been for us and we've learned a lot from these banks as i said each one is different so there is a bank who would be so highly customer focused that all your customer support processes go up five notches after you've got them as a client and you can just replicate that across the board there will be another bank who will say that look i can only work with you if you can geographically distribute yourself across the 25 states and the moment you do that and you take up that challenge uh you automatically have a serviceability across the region across the country for all your partners so i think uh for fintechs and particularly the payment fintechs in in general uh the the core everybody thinks of bank as a payment right as as your primary payment needs are met by the bank so uh even now and going forward they will play a very integral role and and experience of working with the regulator over the period, period of time uh, so uh, i think two points there uh, one is for a for quite a while uh, payment organizations like ourselves have been working with the banks and the networks and they have been in turn regulated by the network yeah. uh, by the yeah. by the regulator and therefore ours has been a step up or a step down if you whatever that you may understand it's only in the last few years that uh, with the payments market evolving and the regulator clearly putting out carving out areas and creating uh, frameworks around it like bharat bill payment and now the payment aggregation right is when players like us have directly started interacting with the regulator and it has been an absolutely phenomenal experience because uh you know here is a country where regulators keenly aware of what is happening yeah i think that is so thrilling to know right that they are aware of absolutely everything that is happening the inputs are being sought in terms of how it is working and look at all the uh, like the uh, fm ma'am uh, nirmala sitaraman ma'am mentioned in her uh, you know speech earlier all the kind of initiatives that the regulator is taking these are all market building kind of initiatives they identify yeah. a gap and they specifically bring in enabling legislation or regulation like let's take you know prepaid as a segment it started way back in 2009 but over the years if you just track it every 2 years or 3 years they understand what's going on figure out what are the gaps bring in the relevant things about enhancing it when ncmc came in they brought that when wallets came in they expanded the definition of wallets they brought in guidelines increased kyc limited kyc so same way for let's say yeah. so this is the beauty about uh, you know and therefore the interaction has been very very uh, interesting and nice 
no no i completely agree with you and i think this is our learning also i mean all the other sectors right uh, financial services is one sector where the regulator is uh, always like at the forefront with respect to how the consumers are thinking what is happening across the globe and uh, they also work very closely with the ecosystem to make sure that uh, things are implemented at the right time uh, i'll move to the next set of questions which i have for both of you this is more to do with the business model basically how the payment gateways has evolved over the period of time right especially uh, we talked about upi right the qr code which has made the payment uh, uh, digital payment available in nooks and corners of this country right at the same time because of uh, regulation and because of mandate those are at zero cost uh, right and players have figured out alternative ways by which they make money uh while enabling this payment infrastructure right uh, but payment gateways like you mentioned karthik at the start of this conversation that the business model was eventually a take rate model basically on every payment which is being settled right uh, of that take rate a line portion of the take rate is being maintained by the issuing bank uh, right uh, given the way the unit economics works right and then a very small sliver is there for everyone else within the supply chain correct with upi which is already 40% of retail uh, payment volume right and a very large uh, uh, growth rate at which it is growing how do you see the business model of payment gateways will evolve over the period of time from where it is today uh okay so actually there are two questions in your one question if you if i may right one is about uh upi or one is about the payment method which is a largish payment method that is uh, regulatorily being mandated to be at a zero cost currently that is one yeah right and the other question is about the players like payment providers or payment service providers uh and their business models around you know in light of let's say that event how is it that this is going to happen uh so i think uh, you have to look at both of them separately and then kind of put them together and see what it means uh so regulatory intervention on interchange is not a new thing as in it has been there in the past in india itself it has been there on debit card earlier and then post that it came out on upi right but if one were to look at uh, you know over the west or some of the other examples right uh in a country like let's say the us interchange rates typically are between a 2.5 to a 3% correct which is one of the highest actually across the world right so while they may have a wall street and a silicon valley but believe me from a payment innovation perspective they are way behind right in india money moves faster uh, quicker 24/7 and it is cheaper than i think i can reasonably say al- almost across the world right even in a country like china where fintech and the entire ecosystem evolved by about 2012 there was like a really large blast of work happening 2013 to 16 so to speak right with the ali pays and the wechats coming in place even there the observed thing is regulator brought down the interchanges to like a 0.1% so per se uh, when you just look at that in isolation this is bound to happen that the but what does it help it helps in access it helps in innovation it helps in making sure that there is accessibility of a payment method for anybody to use and that is the part which one needs to ask that the biggest advantage out of something like this is that today any merchant small big micro small individual uh, partnership doesn't matter the government has made upi free as a payment method plus it also makes it compulsory that you have to offer that you know for your thing which essentially means that everybody is asking for a digital payment mode and that is Correct. a very very big thing uh there were months when one had to go and keep talking about the same thing to the merchant imagine spending hours to 
even convince somebody that digital is useful for you. Correct. We've been through that cycle. So now you don't even need to talk about it, right? Because there are a bunch of hundred other people doing it. And at the same time, the merchant understands that going digital helps them with not only collecting payments faster, but it also retains customers more. It gives them a great experience. It makes something live. It is just not a you know a page which has information. You Correct. also add that, that, that to at zero cost. That to at zero cost, right? So this is the yeah. one part, and I think the implication of that is that it has just helped widen the pie like nobody has ever imagined. So that is one part. The second part is in terms of the business model, or therefore, you know, what is the implication of that on the payment provider, payment service provider? So, yes, I think at a high level, it does mean that one of the payment methods is priced at zero. But you probably are aware that in any case, even in the past, not all the payment methods were Correct. priced at the same value, right? These were all, it's a bunch of, a mix of everything. And like you rightly said, the issuer has a certain reason uh, why it is structured that way, that the issuer gets the bulk of it because the issuers, it's the issuer's customer. The issuer has put the effort to get the customer and uh, you know make sure the customer is engaged and there is a repeat transaction happening and so on so it is likely to be a mix of this kind of a portfolio uh, you know that payment service as a basic payment service will work and then on top of that what ragu said is absolutely relevant and i think you will have more questions on that also from ragu and uh, you know around how more can be done with the same set of players so that this becomes an integral component of what you sell, but at the same time, there is money to be made on other parts. Great. Raghu would love to. Yeah, yeah see, this, uh, this is, uh, in all fairness, this is not my domain, but extraordinary insights uh, by Karthik because that's something that he has been living all these years. Uh, one or two additional data points, uh, as he was speaking, uh, which I understood is uh, in last two years, a uh, lot of magic has happened, right? Uh, we only see the negative impact of COVID, but for a country like India, there has been unprecedented amount of people, be the merchants and consumer, moving to digital naturally. Okay, There has been almost more than 40% surge in number of digital transactions across India. And specifically when you talk about UPI, whatever was the pre-pandemic level, and I say pre-pandemic before March 2020, uh, when you compare the transactions from March 2020 to Jan 2021 and Jan 2021 till Jan 2022, it's more than 3x to 5x than the pre-pandemic level, all the UPA-based transaction compared to all other. So these are unbelievable wonders, right? Naturally, it has happened. And it's it's like you, you can see significant amount of digital imprint and digital acceptance across the new, new, new and color of India, right? It has never happened. And that's the reason the scale increases, like what Karthik was talking about, the speed in which these transactions happens. Uh, I also never gave a thought about it. Probably it's, it's one of the fastest in the world and we try to undermine it. Correct. And Raghu, to you, uh, in your most recent organization, uh, right? You guys are focusing on uh, software as a service, basically for enterprises, right? And at the same time, you are enabling payments. You are enabling BNPL for some of these customers. Uh, how important is these alternative revenue streams, basically, to make the business model, from your point of view, more viable, uh, right? Because again, like Karthik mentioned, that there are different layers within this ecosystem where different players are operating. Correct. Some people are operating more closer to the merchant. Some are operating more closer to the uh, issuer. Uh, right. You guys are are sitting basically more closely with the merchant and with the businesses. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong anywhere. Uh, right. How have you seen uh, basically that journey uh, from a small business perspective to the utilization of a BNPL product and to the utilization of uh, other uh, new banking SaaS tools? Uh, when they subscribe to your services over the period of time. Thanks, Ashish. Very close to me, right? That's exactly what we are doing in Active.ai. Uh, not that we are promoting uh, the brand or what we are doing. We call it uh, uh, Trinity, right? In classical enterprise SaaS companies, like the previous company I was working for, 
the only customer was enterprise and we had started with one product and we started looking at variations of product to sell to them in the current trinity when i say trinity i'm talking about enterprise i'm talking about banks and within the realm of distributor finance or the b2b bnpl we are talking about distributors dealers and retailers we don't go beyond retailers we don't, we are not focusing on the b2c segment so this trinity is where we are exactly focusing and there are three revenue streams for us one is the enterprise second is a bank third is the distributed dealer retailer so the most difficult part is how do you acquire distributors and dealers right so what we are doing is uh, we are solving the real life supply chain problem for the enterprises you take customer x uh, whom we are operating they have say 8000 uh, distributors uh, you have system of records and you have system of engagement the data of all this distributor lie in the system of records correct most often than not the system of record is sap yeah they might be using some other erp but most of these giants use uh, sap uh, but the problem is sap is mother of a single source of truth right uh, outside of sap there are multiple distributed system disconnected system so the organizations usually don't get a single point of view of what are their supply chain needs on every day the communication from the uh, head office to the field uh, sales people to the distributors and dealers and retailer is broken is disconnected and is not real time and for lack of words uh, it also moves in pen and paper that is the level of uh, non digitization that you can see currently even in advance we just spoke about the digital evolution yeah. two minutes back but this is a reality so what we are doing is uh, we are working with this enterprise and digitally converting all the distributors so first step we do before even somebody qualifies for a b2b bnpl okay we ensure that all of them get digitally onboarded i will take an example and then go back to this uh assume there is a there is a distributor who sells uh, 20 lakh uh, rupees worth of biscuits to a, a biscuit giant okay biscuit manufacturer uh, they have to pay the money to uh, this biscuit giant in 3 days okay so after 3 days when they have to pay the money instead of this biscuit giant i will just give example say it is britannia okay they have to pay 20 lakh rupees to britannia the third day they this merchant will not pay the money to britannia it will be kotak mahindra bank who will be paying to britannia okay correct so merchant then will pay the money back to kotak in 7 days 14 days 21 days 30 days depending uh, upon the days, days 60 days he can convert this into uh, term loan correct so basically what happens the two 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 question is what if this person does not pay back money to uh kodak okay there's a stop supply agreement that we have with this uh, customer so this particular person will get deboarded how does the bank underwrite okay for this particular product i'm talking about you do, there is no collateral you don't need to open a bank account so it's, it's just a first of the kind in the industry yeah so what is the what is that in for the enterprise and for them even before this could happen two prerequisites or three prerequisites that has to happen is all of these distributors need to have a digital avatar and that's my favorite correct so these people the entire 360 degree of the digital footprints uh, be it their uh, aadhar card pan number gstn number last two two years bank statement itr everything from the enterprise comes to us okay and we onboard them digitally okay we onboard them digitally and the, and the enterprise get a single point of view of all the digital uh, all of the distributors how are they placed to once we onboard them uh, digitally the second step is we do a financial credit worthiness of all the distributors correct today the reason somebody is at a particular credit is basically there might not be much signs yeah. okay it might be uh, due to the uh, experience yeah. and the uh, intellectual level of the company right which is usually sometimes right sometimes it might be wrong it could be there could be outliers and they are, the, all the enterprise are doing a fantastic job okay so basically we do the financial credit worthiness the next step that we do is uh, we arrive at something known as active score okay we use when the financial credit worthiness is also based on a 200 point uh, mechanism where we look at multiple data points and we use artificial intelligence and machine learning to arrive at the active score it's a score based on 100 100 basis point it's a, it's out of 100 basically 
and whatever is the score the credit happens that's how Correct. the company allows this particular person the credit worthiness somebody could be at 20 lakhs somebody could be 80 lakhs somebody could be at 90 lakhs the same uh, the same credit mechanism or the credit score that has been finalized the bank has accepted you to use Correct. that as underwriting mechanism because of the science behind it mm-hmm. so that is the model and what now happens is uh, this particular distributor who was never having a digital avatar now has a full digital avatar all the transactions are rated okay we uh, we currently have a score that is much better than the beru score and dnb that is having that's what the endorsement that we have got from these people so what did ha- and i'm coming to rounding model rounding model uh, we can monetize from any angle correct okay my favorite that is all of them have a digital footprint and they have a digital track record if you fast forward after 6 months 12 months they can actually deal with any enterprise in the world yeah. they have a clean sheet which has never happened so i call the i call it as making them ready for web 3.0 and metaverse Correct. tomorrow there is a company in thailand who wants to work with these distributors they can directly work because they have a full trail of the digital footprint and life cycle correct so i have one uh, specific question on this and this is i think both for you kartik as well as raghu right and uh, we've seen over the course of last 2 3 years and i don't know whether it is because of necessity or is it because of in- increasing the customer stickiness engagement all of that we've seen companies who are operating on both the sides right trying to overlap and provide more services to the same business uh, right by that i mean is that the payment gateway providers that's a very fairly complicated task right building the pipes with the banks uh, integrating it with all the pipes and making sure that the payment success rates are very very high and on the other end what raghu explained it's a complex underwriting architecture basically which uh, supply chain financing company or a bnpl model is trying to build right uh, we have seen that the companies over the course of last 2 3 years are basically getting into more uh, integration around some of these things uh, right uh, and we wonder from outside whether this is out of necessity or is it basically to increase the customer stickiness and retention onto their platform and how do you think basically about uh, this when you embark upon from your side to this side of the table so basically uh, the answer is both uh, now what typically happens is that uh, very often uh, customers depending on the kind of technology they use and the kind of workflows they have within their organizations uh, digital payments is one process within the finance organization and most cfos and uh, you know finance professionals big or small clearly understand that digitizing or or adopting digital is not just about digital payments but also about digitizing a a whole large workflow and a set of all finance processes so which is one of the reasons why the natural extensions of digital payment led uh, you know uh, workflow if somebody has already done that it automatically becomes the other streams or other processes which includes accounts receivable accounts payable the taxation led journeys gst filing right so uh, and then of course lending or supply chain finance becomes another block because you as an enterprise know that these are the problems you have solved and now what you want to do is you want to provide a platform or an opportunity for your suppliers uh, or your key stakeholders for them to be able to avail these digital benefits and it in turn also benefits you so uh, what one sees is a combination of two three things one is about digitizing in overall sense the second is about the ecosystem linkages and how players see the benefits coming back to them in all these modes and that creates the demand so this is on the demand side on the supply side you're right that players who have implemented one platform do feel that you know extending it in some manner and uh, that's where you know the expertise comes in if you are really uh, well aware of a certain kind of a segment or a certain type of ecosystem for example if you have done a lot of work with say agricultural companies 
then you know that supply chain, you know the ecosystem, you know the linkages. So it is easier and smarter to be able to create additional uh, for hooks there or workflows there that can uh, positively stroke the base work. Does this require a very different DNA, uh, right? Or you think that uh, given the merchant segment or the customer segment is same eventually, and you understand the nuances associated to it, uh, one can still develop the product basically for this market. So uh, I think uh, finally, if you go and ask any fintech, you give them any challenge, they'll be more than happy to take it and say that they will deliver. That is the, uh, you know, that is the starting point. The rest comes out of just the focus and the energy that you're able to bring on. So it requires, in fact, the same DNA that got them to do the first thing in the first place. Uh, of course, capabilities that you need to do and what you need to build as skill sets, those are different, but nothing else otherwise. So Ashish, uh, one, one point uh, uh, which I want to touch upon here, uh, what Karthik said is, see, when you look from the merchant side, okay, with a lot of innovation that is being brought, new changes are also coming, right? Even which is going to drive their behavioral changes, okay? When we speak about B2B, BNP, let's understand one thing. Currently, not that they are not availing a finance, right? Currently, people have uh, overdraft and cash credit kind of facilities from the bank. So assume there's a distributor who has a one crore rupees overdraft cash credit which a bank gives. Fantastic. But does anybody be the company? It could be Nestle, Britannia or the bank. Do they know where this money is being used? Nobody knows. It could be used for any purpose. And that's where what we are driving is, we call it as a purpose, B2B BNPL is a purpose-based finance or we call it as a bid size credit. If today the necessity is to pay 10 lakhs to enterprise, exactly that 10 lakh is what is being extended. So the bid size credit is a revolution that is being brought. Okay. And also what we are pioneering is, okay. Usually in the Indian finance industry, you be an individual, you turn to a merchant. But what happens is you get finance for what you are and not what you do. Correct. That's where the revolution we are bringing. You get the BNPL credit for what you do and, and not for what you are. So that's the important Correct. demarcation that we are driving today in the industry. Correct. Uh, given we are already at 550, my last set of questions are basically on uh, how the industry will shape over the course of next few years. Right? We've seen that the throughput, which is happening digitally, has increased multifold over the course of last several years. Uh, but where we are, this is still just scratching the surface, right? And over the course of next decade, over the course of next five years, the total throughput volume is going to become five times, 10 times. Uh, we are processing right now $300 billion. We'll be processing uh, maybe $2 trillion worth of payment uh, eventually, correct? So from that perspective, how well the current infrastructure, which we have, is uh, built to manage scale? How important any you, the new, uh, uh, the payment infrastructure, which NCPI is uh, suggesting becomes important in grand scheme of things in order to make the network decongested and help in increase the sustainability of this digital payment infrastructure. So uh, uh, at a high level, Ashish, uh, Innovation, one of, the, one of the pillars, if I may, is about the rails that exist, right? And uh, NUE basically promises to uh, deliver whoever are the entities who will take on that task. It promises to deliver new rails uh, and it, you can pretty much imagine that in the 1900s when the railroads were being built in the US, right? Uh, somebody gave, I think, uh, uh, Uday, I read some article on where Uday Kotak had basically spoke about how the horses were replaced by the railroads. Uh, but now we are at a point where the horses have to be straight away replaced by the uh, jet cars. The railroads phase is gone. Uh, but what we are really talking about is the plumbing that we have, uh, 
the albeit slightly new in the next 10 years if you start putting thought today that is when in the next 3 to 5 years you will have a new plumbing altogether that plumbing is very very critical to uh, growth both in terms of throughput and the uh, you know the way ecosystem can engage the way players can leverage it etc and i think that is where the direction of nue is uh, very significant uh, the fm also spoke about the cbdc right yeah and uh, that again promises to be a entirely wholly new rails right so what will have to happen is these will have to be thought through very well implemented in a cohesive and a very strong manner with a good amount of participation from various players so that you know it is successful and it is not creating silos or creating issues and the advantage is uh, india has a, a ready base to you know do things and a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, you know the the right kind of capital that can go into building these out so that's where it is correct no you are absolutely right you touched upon cbc uh, dc and this was my next question right because the incumbents will have to figure out how they transition correct and it is not going to be easy uh, right yeah ashish uh, uh, the point is uh, that's one i have very strong feeling on the contrary right okay we are looking at a systematic way of innovation whatever uh, fm ma'am spoke fantastic that's from the policy level and they are implementing rbi now is evangelizing digital rupee to everything a great change is happening but let's understand understand the avalanche of technology it's not about only india we are going to be influenced by what is happening across the world and the pace of innovation pace of change that is happening specifically in the technology world is viral right you sleep today you get up tomorrow something new has come and more often than not we have to react to that yeah. correct and that is what is going to be a prime today we we plan we will do xyz for next 5 years but once these technological advancement comes you have to react to it one of my favorite character in uh, marvel comics and dc is iron man right and what i always say is why iron man is so powerful he has the capability to process trillion of data points not by himself he has somebody known as jarvis correct he says hey jarvis build me one of the best iron man suit he is going to is going to traverse the entire uh, universe right and give something in no seconds so every one of us would have to have a personal jarvis some day or other right and we are talking about a stage where we believe it or not the future generation say people who are 30 and less or even 20 or less are focusing only on the metaverse they already have started creating their avatar they have started living in a virtual world while we want to solve the problem and create newer solution for this world okay we might be wanting to create solutions for that world because we will be left to, we will be that's a necessity you can't live without it so the the pace of change on the pace of influence is like the confusion that we have right should we regulate uh, crypto or not we might be thinking but something larger comes up overnight so that is going to influence the whole innovation correct correct no uh, i think ragu touched upon very interesting things and uh, will not go into some of those because we are already near our budgeted time sure. but, <laughs> but i think uh, 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 it can be a much longer debate uh, right uh, 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 is there any question from the audience? I can only see one question, which Karthik has already uh, responded to. So I think I can see these two questions that the so CBDC uh, is a very interesting concept, and uh, I'm pretty sure that the regulator will think in different ways, and the introduction of that will also come based on experience that others have had, and so on. But I think the key is that uh, the banks who are the incumbents and players whoever are incumbents and the new players, somewhere there has to be a hand in hand that leads them, right? To start with, the newer players or the fintechs can be let to ride a bit loose and you know they can get or create traction. But as soon as that happens, 
yeah there is a rain around it to say that you know is it happening in a way that you want it to happen so that kind of a tug and pull will have to happen at the same time the traditional players with their strengths their distribution networks their capital bases low access to capital they need to be also partnering with these uh, new age companies in a manner that they are able to leverage their strengths and at the same time also provide value to the other partners so i think that's the kind of approach that might work and uh, uh, what the incumbents can do is collaborate and what the the new guys can do is recognize that you know the old has its own wisdom and strength Correct. and they put it together so Correct. thank you so much karthik uh, uh, we are already near the budgeted time allotted to us yep all right thank you thank so you. much divendra over to you thanks thanks karthik thanks raghi thanks raghu thanks ashish for the insightful panel thank thanks a lot for your time thanks guys thanks devendra karthik and ashish thank you thank you raghu thanks ashish thank you bye thank you everyone